In our last lecture, we looked at temperature sensors. How to measure temperature? Typically with temperature, the output is a resistance with an RTD or a thermistor. I'll then use the voltage divider and instrumentation amplifier to amplify it. Here, I can do about the same thing with audio and strain. Now, starting out with audio sensors. There are many different types of microphones. Some are essentially speakers. From duality, if you apply current to a speaker, you get sound. If you apply sound to a speaker, you get current or voltage. Um, the fidelity is not great, but speakers do work as microphones. The voltage isn't large, but then using an instrumentation amplifier, I can crank up the voltage so you can hear it. Some microphones are piezo crystals. Quartz has a property. If I squeeze quartz, I produce a voltage. If I apply voltage, I make the quartz squeeze. The latter is how you produce twe uh, tweeters. Apply a voltage to it, and it uh, slightly compresses, making sound. On the transducer side, if you apply sound to a piezo, it produces a small voltage. Um, others use strain gauges and membranes. As sound waves hit the membrane, it moves, which produces stress and strain. The strain gauges will then measure the strain. Uh, most of the microphones that we have in the ECU building are electet condenser microphones, like the ones you see there. These are essentially variable resistors. To power one of these microphones, what you need is a ground point, obviously, and a pull-up resistor. Essentially, this is a variable resistance. With the pull-up resistor, if the voltage or the resistance changes, I'm getting a variable voltage at uh, terminal one. That variable voltage is then what I need to amplify to drive the rest of my circuit. Now, when I do that, I've got this pull-up resistor. They recommend about a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor. I'm going to have a very small audio signal at X with a large DC offset. One way around that is to use a DC block. I could use an instrumentation amplifier, or sometimes it's easier to just block the DC level. That's what this capacitor does. Replace it with ground. And now the voltage at Y is roughly the same as voltage at X minus the DC term. I chose one of RC to be 0.1, or one of RC is 10, which is uh, 1.6 hertz. So this is a DC block. It blocks frequencies below 1.6 hertz, passes frequencies above it, meaning the audio range. I'll then have an amplifier that cranks up the gain. If there's a slight DC offset, it'll also amplify the offset. So again, block the DC level, block the DC offset, amplify it again, keep on amplifying, and eventually have a large enough signal. And it's fairly common in audio. Block the DC offset, amplify. Block the DC offset, amplify. Some things you can do with this. A uh, fairly fun project is to transmit sound on a light beam. With a previous circuit, I can take a small signal, say from your cell phone, and amplify it to plus minus 5 volts. I can also transmit sound on a light beam. Here what you do is I'll take a diode, an LED, bias it so that the light is turn turning on. I'll then add a slight current based upon the AC source. By superposition, I've got two inputs. If this input is zero, I just have a DC current going through the diode. Um, if I turn off the 5 volt source and apply one here, I now have a voltage coming through a 1K resistor. So 1 volt is 1 milliamp. This biases the LED with plus or minus 1 milliamp for 1 volt. I'm changing the brightness, changing the current. That current then hits a cadmium sulfide light sensor. Changing the resistance, the variable resistance causes variable voltage on X. Here I have got the sound traveling on a light beam. If I break the light beam, there's no sound. If I let the light travel, I can hear the signal. Um, one kind of sidelight. If you have a audio signal going to a microprocessor, it's difficult for a microprocessor to read at, um, audio signals. It's varying too quickly. What I could do is have an envelope detector. Convert the AC signal and just pull off the amplitude. The first stage of an amplitude or envelope detector is the following circuit. Um, kind of a backlight, satellite. I could use a diode. However, diodes have a 0.7 volt drop. If they have a small audio signal, that 0.7 volts is going to block my signal. So this is a circuit that doesn't have a 0.7 volt drop. It turns on and off at zero. 
The way it works, if x is positive, v plus equals v minus, so if x is 1 volt, v minus is 1 volt. I've got 1 volt across 10k, 0.1 milliamp flowing. The 1 milliamp, 0.1 milliamp comes from the op amp. That turns on the diode and applies 1 mil, 0.1 milliamp to the resistor. If x is negative, I'm trying to have current go backwards through here. Current can't go backwards through the diode, so the diode turns off. If the diode is turned off, y is tied to ground. So this is a circuit where y equals x for x positive, y equals 0 for x negative. It's a half-wave rectifier. What the output looks like is this. Again, for positive voltage, the diode turns on. Negative voltage, diode turns off. Positive turns on, negative turns off. So there's the half-wave rectifier. To convert that to an envelope detector, add a capacitor. Now what happens is, when x is positive, I charge up the capacitor. When x is negative, the diode turns off and the capacitor holds the charge. And it decays through R, it's an RC time constant. What that looks like is the following. I charge, discharge, charge, discharge capacitors. Now I've got a fairly clean DC signal at the points. The microprocessor can read these voltages and find out what's the amplitude of the audio signal. And I don't have to sample at uh, 20 kilohertz to read the envelope. That's a kind of a useful trick. If I want to have a circuit that's based upon the amplitude of an audio signal, envelope detectors are very useful for that. Um, another sidelight too. If you don't want to have a plus minus power supply, you can get by with a single power supply. In lab, what I would do is I'd recommend just using plus minus power. Our power supplies have plus 10 volts, minus 10 volts. It's available, use it, makes life easier. In senior design, if I don't want to have two batteries in my uh, device, I can get by by saying I've got my battery, say 5 volts in ground, treat the midpoint as circuit ground. Circuit ground doesn't have to be earth ground. That's oftentimes why you have two different symbols for the grounds. Earth ground is 0 volts. Circuit ground is 2.5 volts. This circuit thinks that 2.5 volts is circuit ground, so likewise they'll have an AC signal operating on plus minus relative to circuit ground. Just a side light. So that's kind of some things you can do with audio sensors. With that, I can take a microphone, amplify your voice, um, take your cell phone, amplify it, drive the push-pull amplifier like we did in lecture three. Uh, the last type of sensor I want to look at is a strain gauge. A uh, strain gauge is measure strain, of course. What strain is, is when you bend a piece of metal, the metal stretches on the outside edge or compresses on the inside edge. That's stress and strain. Um, stress and strain are a function of the material based upon Young's modulus, the shear modulus, bulk modulus, Poisson's ratio, and they vary with the material. A couple definitions. Young's modulus is stress over strain. That's the force per unit length and change. Young's modulus tells you how much a piece of metal behaves like a spring. As I pull on it, it is going to stretch slightly. The shear modulus is the force parallel over area. Uh, bulk modulus is the change in volume related to pressure. And the Poisson's ratio is the change in width with the, respect to the change in, in length. Those typically are constants for any material. Um, the theory behind a strain gauge is if I have a long piece of wire, the resistance is the resi resistivity times length over area. If I pull on the wire, the length is going to increase by Young's modulus, and the area will decrease for conservation of mass. Um, so the change in length varies with the force. The change in resistance also varies with the force. The net result is the change in resistance is proportional to the force applied. Uh, for example, if I have a steel wire that's one meter long, area is one square millimeter, and apply 10 newtons force, the length is going to change by 50 microns. The resistance is going to change, not by a lot, but it does change. That's kind of the idea behind strain gauges. A strain gauge is a piece of metal on a typically a mylar membrane. You glue the mylar to the material you want to measure, and as the material stretches, the strain gauge stretches along with it. As it stretches, the resistance goes up. To increase the sensitivity, I'll take the wire and run it back and forth in a zigzag pattern. That increases the effective length of the wire over a smaller area. And then I glue that to the material. 
The strain gauge is fairly thin, the material is fairly flexible, so as the metal stretches, the strain gauge will stretch with it. Um, to use the strain gauge, I need to place it on a smooth material to maximize the contact with the mylar coating, and place the wires so that they're in the direction of the strain that I want to measure. Then, once I do that, I need to ampl amplify the bejeebers out of it. Uh, for example, if I have a, a beam and a push on it and a duplex, that's going to cause strain. This is how a bathroom scale is built. I've got a, a beam that's placed between two endpoints. As I stand on the scale, this beam is going to flex. If I can measure the strain on it, I can measure the force. To calculate the strain, if it's normally straight, if I push on it, then it pushes, uh, compresses by five centimeters, five millimeters. Um, I need to find out the radius of the circle that this maps out. Um, that would be the end point has a radius of r. The midpoint is r minus five because it's deflected by five millimeters. And assuming it's a 50 millimeter beam, um, half the length is 25. Solve for r, and I get 65 millimeters for the radius. And there's an inside edge and outside edge. As I go further out, the circumference increases. The strain is related to the circumference. So on the outer edge, it'll be the radius versus the center line divided by the radius. I'm at plus 0.07 strain on the outer edge. On the inner edge, I have minus 0 0.007, compression versus uh, tension. If I have a strain gauge, strain gauges typically have relationships like this. It's 120 plus 2.14 times the strain. The strain was 0 0.0077. Plug it in, I'll have resistance going from 120 ohms to 121.9 ohms. Not a lot, but it is there. To amplify that to 0 to 5 volts, I need an instrumentation amplifier. The gain I need is change in output over change in input. Um, output changes by 5 volts as the input changes by 2.5 volts, so I need a gain of 244. The offset, I want the output to be put to be 0 at 0 strain. This is 2.5 volts at zero strain, so that's 2.5, typically made with a voltage divider as well. And I want the output to go up as x goes up. So in this case, they connect with plus out input. This would be a circuit that outputs minus or zero to five volts as the strain goes from zero to 0 0.0077. Um, there's a couple of variations on this. For temperature compensation, what I can do is make the top resistor, also a thermistor. Just put it perpendicular to the other one, so this isn't measure strain, that is measuring strain. That's one variation. That way these are both the temp same temperature. As temperature goes up, up and down, they vary together. A second variation is put this on the inner edge, the bottom on the, on the outer edge. As the bottom one goes up, the inner one goes down. That gives you double the sensitivity. And a third variation is this 2.5 volts. If I make that with a similar voltage divider, and, but make it the opposite, so as x goes up, y goes down, or this goes down, I'll have four times the sensitivity at four times the cost. Well, where strain gauges are used is, like I mentioned before, this is how bathroom scale is built. I can use a strain gauge to build a pressure sensor. If I have pressure on the inside, pressure on the outside in the membrane, if the inside pressure is greater than the outside pressure, this will flex, producing strain. By measuring strain, I'm measuring the pressure difference. I can build accelerometers. Put a strain gauge on a beam connected to a mass. As I accelerate up, this is going to deflect going down. The deflection I can measure with a strain gauge. That's also how accelerometers are built. So that kind of wraps up uh, audio and strain sensors. They're basically resistors. If I can measure resistance, I can measure about anything.